Okay, it's time to get started. Um, welcome to the Zoominar today. By presentations are by Dr. Sarik and uh, Dr. Vasallo. Uh, first speaker is going to be Dr. Angela Sarik, is an assistant professor at the Institute of Science and Technology uh, from Austria. She obtained a PhD in chemical physics from Columbia University in 2013, followed by postdoctoral research at the University of Cambridge. She started her independent research group at University College London in 2016, where she is currently also an associate professor of biological physics. Her lab uh, develops computer models at the interface of soft matter, physical chemistry, and life sciences. She is an Embo Young investigator and a recipient of the ERC starting grant and the Valoi Scholarship and the PG um, Dijon uh, Award. With this short introduction, it is my pleasure to invite Angela to give her a talk. Angela, get started. Thank you so much, Hans. Uh, thanks for the invitation and introduction. It's such a pleasure to speak in this distinguished series where so many of my science heroes have spoken. And I have to say my group loves um, this series, so thank you for carrying on for such a long uh, time. So today I'll briefly tell you about our computational work on physics of amyloid formation and inhibition. And I'll start with, you know, the general um, brief introduction on what amyloid aggregation is, which is what you all probably know. It's a process in which usually soluble proteins um, spontaneously switch into their sticky forms and start aggregating into these long fibrils that are rich in beta sheet structure. And at the heart of this process is really this stochastic conformational change from a soluble form, which, whatever that might be, into beta sheets, which then these beta sheets stack on top of each other and form fibrils. And I mean, it's a quite physically quite an interesting process, right? Um, it's seen actually in almost every protein is if sufficiently destabilized. Um, so it's believed that amyloid aggregation is another kind of thermodynamically stable form of uh, proteins. But also, as we all know, and what also this uh, series focuses on, it's um, related to a number of uh, diseases. For instance, um, amyloid aggregation is implicated in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, type 2 diabetes. And like, if you look at all these proteins that are implicated in these diseases that form um, aggregates, they're all pretty different in their sequence, in their conformation. And yet again, they form the same type of a fibril. So there must be something kind of more general about this behavior, which is not necessarily driven by you know, fine details of the sequence, but kind of by general physical chemical interactions between proteins. So um, we find that interesting in its own. And for a number of years now, we've been interested in the physics of this process. So how can you know, all these different proteins make the same type of a fibril? And if you think about you know, modeling of um, self-assembly in general, as you know, there is a lot of work focused on the kind of atomistic structure and dynamics of individual molecules. And then there is a lot of continuum modeling kind of trying to describe the kinetic course of assembly, um, so assembly in time. But then, you know, there's a scale in between, which is where the interesting physics happens of kind of nucleation um, of such structures. So, um, and you know, it's clearly a multi-scale phenomenon. You need to take a bunch of these individual molecules, create a nucleus, and then form something that you measure um, at a continuum scale in your test tube. So what we argue is that kind of to try to bridge these molecular and continuum scales, you don't necessarily need to know where each atom and each water molecule go in each point of time, especially in such general phenomena as amyloid aggregation, but you still need to retain the granularity of the building blocks. So what our lab does is we try to develop minimal coarse grain models of building blocks that contain only the key information on their shape or effective interactions, but then we can study how a large number of those comes together, nucleates, forms fibrils, and we can measure the same properties you would measure in bulk. And then um, in this way, by comparing our measurements to those in bulk, we can 
uh, infer what, which kind of molecular processes are going on. And um, if you think about analyte aggregation, you know, there's a number going on. Today I'll speak about the two. So the first one is um, the formation of first fibrils. So now we know um, that fibrils themselves are actually not the main toxic species. There is a large discussion about these uh, small oligomers, but we know um, that small oligomers that don't have this um, typical beta sheet structure and can vary in size and so on um, are, can cause cell death. So there is a large discussion about that they might be the kind of most toxic species. But kind of from a physics uh, point of view, it's interesting because they are usually observed next to the fibrils. And kind of from a physics point of view, we ask a question, what is the relationship between these small oligomers, which I view kind of as some sort of disordered clumps, and the fibrils, are they on pathway, off pathway, kind of um, byproducts and so on. But then, you know, once a small amount of fibrils is formed, the problem is that they start effectively self-replicating, which is called secondary nucleation. So they somehow make a uh, template the formation of their own copies, and they do so via these small oligomers. So it's been measured that fibrils produce these small oligomers, which then convert into fibrils um, only at a later stage. So even though the fibril itself may not be uh, toxic, um, it might be producing the cytotoxic species. But again, from a physics point of view, um, it's a super interesting process, right? How can a passive structure make its own copies? So these are the two questions I'll be um, briefly addressing today. And all the work has been done with Thomas Knowles in Cambridge and Sarah Lindsay in Lund. And it has started with Dan Frankel um, in Cambridge. OK, so um, let's think about minimal modeling. As I told you, you know, this process um, is observed in so many different proteins. Um, albeit, albeit in, uh, in a bit different conditions, but it seems to have some general features. So what is it we absolutely need to capture it? So we need at least two states. We need a soluble state and a fibril forming state, right? And there needs to be a conformational switch between the two. And then we need to, the soluble state or a version of a soluble state to be able to form these um, transient oligomers, these um, dispersed, uh, disordered oligomers. Um, so what, the way we describe, kind of in a very minimalistic, kind of top-down modeling, um, the way we describe a soluble protein is as a particle that has an attractive patch at the tip. And this patch weakly interacts with other patches like um, this and forms transient oligomers, which usually fall apart um, and can go kind of back and forth. And then the fibril forming um, state is also a particle, but with a side patch. And the side patch drives assembly side to side and on top of each other of these particles, and you form a fibril. Okay, so the two types of um, two states one forms transient oligomers, and one forms stable fibrils. And then, what else do we know kind of about the dynamics and energetics of the process? So, we know that a protein is never or very rarely found in this beta sheet prone state on its own. So we know that this state on its own is higher in free energy, but we also know that it sticks stronger to its own kind than the soluble one because these fibrils are irreversible. So um, another kind of rule of the game that we add to this is that we penalize each switch from a soluble into this beta sheet prone by an excess in chemical potential. So this state is higher in energy, but then it sticks strongly to itself, much stronger than this state. So those are the simplest rules of the game, and we do Monte Carlo simulations. And kind of already this tells you that this state will very rarely happen because it's unfavorable. But then, because it sticks strongly to its own kind, if it happens to be surrounded um, by its own uh, kind, it's going to uh, stay stable and then keep on growing. OK, um, and then just briefly to comment on the parameters, you can somewhere in between. We did estimate it also using optimistic simulations, but again, um, what you would guess by kind of, um, normal reasoning also came out from um, these simulations. OK, so I'll briefly show you in one slide how this model captures nucleation solution. 
Then I'll take you more towards the cellular context and show you how it can capture nucleation of membranes um, and compare to experimental data. Then I'll show you how we extended it to capture the self-replication and then uh, the very recent unpublished data on how we think about inhibition of this self-replication. Okay, so um, initially, you know, you have a bunch of soluble proteins in your solution. And here we put them at very high concentration just to show you, um, just to illustrate the point. So what happens is these proteins jiggle around, they form uh, oligomers, you can see one here. And then we see that an oligomer converts into fibril uh, that then keeps on growing, and this is kind of a plaque developing. So we learned that fibrils are, these oligomers are fibril nucleation centers, and that's particularly important at low concentration. So if you, in the cell, this can be an animalar concentration. So if you imagine like a large box filled with these small individual proteins, it's just a section of our system. Uh, what we see is that we get these transient oligomers that most of the time just fall apart because they're um, thermodynamically unstable. But then if you wait a long time, um, you can get two proteins um, to convert into this beta state within them, and then uh, the nucleus keep, keeps on growing. So these transient oligomers are you know, at very improbable, at very low concentration, but they enable proteins to meet, and this is where nucleation happens, especially at low concentrations. And then this type of nucleation of this, you know, small oligomers, if you wish, um, the pre-nucleation um, condensate, has a very different free energy profile from classical nucleation of, I don't know, ice and um, bubbles. But I'll not go um, into the details of that, but I'll take you a bit uh, more towards the cellular environment. So we know that all amyloidogenic proteins are either membrane bound or membrane cleaved, and we know that membranes influence uh, their aggregation. And that's also seen um, you know, in vitro. This is um, an example of amyloid fibrils growing from the surface of a giant unilateral vesicles. These are from uh, alpha synuclein. And it's been measured that on vesicles, um, alpha synuclein nucleation is about 1,000 times faster than in solution. And in fact, the membrane um, state um, it influences the kinetics. It was found that fluid membranes catalyze nucleation, so the nucleation is very fast, while gel, the gel membrane is not so much. And kind of in my physics mind, I thought, well, this makes sense. If you have a fluid membrane and proteins absorb onto it or interact with it, um, the fluidity of the membranes is going to move proteins around. They'll meet each other more often and then they'll nucleate. So this is how I imagined it. And we decided to check whether this is indeed uh, what happens in simulations. And of course, I'll show you that my intuition was wrong. So to do that, we extended our model using um, a standard kind of um, coarse grain model for lipids, which has only three particles, a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic um, tail. And we can tune the phase of the membrane by changing the stickiness between the tails. So again, that's a standard model by Desernon that has been um, benchmarked to reproduce the uh, mechanics and kind of dynamics of um, biological membranes. So if you make these tails very sticky, you'll get a gel phase. So the membrane will be quite ordered and things will not move around. But if the interaction is relatively weak, you'll get a fluid phase and the lipids will move around. And now we couple that to our model for protein. We allow the soluble protein to absorb. And then when it switches to this beta sheet form, we allow it also to insert into the membrane bilayers. So this um, uh, red patch now interacts with the hydrophobic um, core of the membrane because it's been found that uh, amylogenic proteins change their conformation when inserted into the membrane and they'd like to stick their hydrophobic parts into the um, uh, core. Okay, now I'll show you what happens. On the left side, we have gel membranes, so the one that doesn't move around much. Here, proteins absorb, they meet each other, they form this uh, small oligomers, and then they, that's where the nucleation happens, and you get kind of the growth of a fiber from the surface, kind of epitaxial, just like what you would see on any other heterogeneous surface. So you form kind of protein-rich fibrils. But in fluid membranes, something very different happens. 
So what happens is that proteins absorb and then they start conucleating with lipids. Because fluid membranes usually are associated with easy extraction of a lipid outside of the membrane. So what happens is that you get this heterogeneous nucleus that has both proteins and lipids and the addition of lipids lowers the nucleation barrier. And what you get is a very special type of uh, kind of heterogeneous nucleation in which the catalyst itself participates in the composition of the nucleus. So we found that what occurs is the formation of lipid rich fibrils. So they kind of conucleate. And then we measured the rate of nucleation, um, which is given here by these colors um, as a function of protein membrane binding and also the fluidity. And of course, you can imagine if you have very weak binding it will, of protein to the membrane, nothing will happen. If you have a very strong one, also the proteins would not like to convert uh, to this beta G state, but kind of in the middle, you have very fast nucleation. And indeed, it's faster the more fluid the membrane is, because the membrane fluidity here um, is not, the reason is not that because the membrane is fluid per se, but that the membrane fluidity correlates with how easy it is to extract a uh, lipid out and donate it to this heterogeneous nucleus. But then what we were super happy about is that now we can start comparing uh, to data. So from the Knowles group, we got um, the rates of alpha synuclein nucleation on uh, lipids of different hydrophobic um, tail length. So here the chemistry stays constant, but by changing just the length of the tail, you change the fluidity. So the longer it is, the stronger the tails stick to each other and the more gel-like the membrane is. And we realized that um, a good kind of um, dimensionless parameter is the area per lipid. Right? The higher the area per lipid, the more fluid the membrane is, but also the easier it is to extract the lipid out. And indeed, we found, as I told you in simulations, that the higher the fluidity, so the higher the area per lipid, the faster the nucleation. And the line kind of um, corresponds to the experimental one that's been measured in these experiments. And I'll just give a, a final kind of slide remark here. Uh, as such um, fibrils that are filled with lipids keep on growing, they of course suck lipids out. And what we found in simulations is that they form pores, um, quite disordered uh, pores. And it's also been observed and actually measured in experiments that um, amyloid aggregation on lipids causes um, flux of um, ions through it. So we are currently um, at a stage where we are trying to quantify this and uh, again compare to data. Okay, um, so here in this um, part I showed you, showed you that lipids conucleate with proteins and it's a kind of new type of nucleation where the surface enters the aggregate composition. But what's really key here is not the fluidity per se, but the fact that fluidity often correlates with the ease of extraction of lipids out of uh, the membrane. Um, and now, in the last um, eight minutes or so, I'll tell you uh, a bit about um, fibril self-replication, um, uh, so-called secondary nucleation, um, um, which, as I told you, occurs via these um, oligomers. And, um, you know, you might wait a very long time to get the first fibril, but then this process is so much faster than the initial nucleation, uh, for A-beta is found to be eight orders of magnitude faster. So, of course, if you measure uh, an experiment, this is what's going to dominate your um, measurement. And, of course, this also gives rise to exponential growth of fibril mass. If a fibril makes new fibrils and these new fibrils make new fibrils, so you'll get exponential growth, which you'll know too well after uh, this pandemic. And this might be, you know, the uh, problematic uh, step in the aggregation. So uh, we wanted to extend our model to try to understand how this can occur. So the first thing we allowed for is the absorption of a protein to the fibril surface. We found that that in its own doesn't, cannot speed up nucleation by eight or this magnitude. It can give you, you know, just this mass transport and the fact that proteins meet in almost 1D versus 3D can give you um, up to two or this magnitude um, higher nucleation rates, but not eight. So we realized what absolutely needs to be there is an additional conformational change. 
um, into sort of another confirmation, which is more prone to oligomerization and um, creation. And um, very recently, we also had um, experimental signatures of those. So now what happens is proteins absorb, they form oligomers, and then only when bound on the surface, they can shift into this um, uh, conformation that sticks stronger to its own kind and then is more prone to oligomerization and therefore more prone to nucleation. So I'll show you what happens. Here we put the first fibrillin solution. It's capped, so it cannot grow. What happens is healthy proteins absorb. They form these um, oligomers, which you can see here in red. And these oligomers convert into new nuclei, which then um, uh, would give rise to new nuclei and their nuclei to new nuclei, but we only look at um, so in the first generation. But what, what we're happy about is that now we can start comparing to, again, um, bulk data. So what was observed in experiment is that if you measure the rate of the secondary nucleation with concentration, the scaling exponent called reaction order continuously changes over the concentration range, which is it's given by the slope in this log log plot. And the kind of in a small chemistry, small molecule chemistry, this would mean that your mechanism somehow continuously changes. But actually, we observed in simulations this uh, change happens very naturally in our simulations as well. We don't get the same numbers, but we get the same trends, and we can say why. So what we observed in, in simulations is that if you have a low protein concentration, there's only few proteins absorb onto the surface. If you add more, the reaction becomes faster. But at high protein concentration, the surface is completely saturated. So you add more, but the reaction doesn't get any faster. So this kind of tells you that what controls the self-replication is absorption of soluble proteins onto the fibril surface. So we suggested to measure that in experiment, which Thomas did using SPR. And indeed, they found where the protein, that with the fibril surface coverage saturates with proteins, this is where the reaction order also saturates. So um, we're happy about that. As I said, it tells you that what controls the process is the absorption of soluble proteins on the surface. But it also tells you kind of how you can try to control it. You can try to control it by changing the uh, stickiness of proteins to the fibrils, which we did using ionic strength and temperature and denaturants in a series um, of papers. But you can also possibly control it with inhibitors. And in fact, you know, a number of inhibitors of secondary nucleation has been identified over the last years. One is, this is Brico's chaperon. Here it's uh, immunogold uh, labeled. And what's been found is that it absorbs onto the fibril surface uh, and it can completely kind of, um, inhibit self-replication even at what looks like stops the geometric ratio. So we were um, interested in this process and initially we modeled inhibitors as particles that simply um, compete with proteins for the fibril surface. And in my mind, what I thought that this is going to be trivial, you add something that competes with proteins for the fibril surface. So, um, you know, it's not going to be uh, adding inhibitors it would be equivalent to kind of having less monomers. And of course, uh, this is what you would um, expect from kind of competitive binding kinetics. So um, if this is your reaction rate, and this is how many monomers you have absorbed onto the surface, you can change that either by changing monomers. So you add lower concentration of proteins, you have lower concentration of, mon of monomers on the surface, and you have lower rate. You can also control it by adding inhibitors. So you add inhibitors, you push monomers out, you have lower rate. So this is what the theory would tell you, this is what my intuition told me. But what we found in experiment, actually, is again Thomas Knowles' experiment uh, in Sarah Linze, what we found is that adding um, inhibitors actually scales very differently to changing um, concentration of monomers. So they don't behave um, equally, and it's not a simple competitive binding. And then we went back and forth for like five years, between theory, experiment, and simulations, and we found that this type of behavior can be only um, explained if um, the surface is not fully catalytic, but it has some very well-defined catalytic sites, each of which can be covered by one inhibitor. Only then do you get such a difference in scaling between um, inhibitor and monomer. So, 
We know that these catalytic sites need to be far from each other. They should not communicate. Uh, we don't know what they are, uh, but this was the prediction kind of from the model. When we included that into the kinetics, we um, got the data as measured in uh, experiment. Then we also um, developed kind of a kinetic model with, based on this mechanism, and we saw that it indeed fits the data better than the um, kind of a homogeneous surface uh, assumption. And very recently, this is uh, unpublished data from the Nose Lab, we indeed found that um, the inhibitors bound to the surface at a very substequiometric um, level. So here you have, I don't know, 25 micromolar fibrils and how much inhibitors bound to them is 0.1 micromolar and then the, um, the surface is saturated. So really the uh, inhibitor cannot bind everywhere. Um, it's probably binds to some said, special catalytic sites uh, so the reaction rate will still scale as a surface, but not as a homogeneous surface. So this is where we currently are. We hope to get this out soon, but I'll wrap up here and I'll, I hope I've shown you that um, amyloid nucleation is a distant class of nucleation mechanism by these disordered oligomers, can be catalyzed by lipids, um, and the self-replication is governed by the deposition of healthy proteins and fibrils, which occurs on discrete isolated sites. And more generally, I hope I've given you a flavor for how these minimal models, they are toy models, but they preserve the correct physics, given the assumptions, can be helpful in bridging molecular and continuum scales and explaining data uh, that we have at hand. And I'll just thank my group, in particularly Samo, who did most of the work uh, I've shown you, and uh, Johannes, who did all the membrane work. They were really heroes of this. Dan, Thomas, and Sarum. And I'll take an opportunity if anyone wants to join us near Vienna to drop me a line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for a great talk. Um, let's take uh, questions from Q and A. Let's wait for maybe a minute or so. I have a question on your uh, nucleation of the protein on the membrane surface. You talked about the gel versus fluid membrane. It's understandable in gel phase you don't have the you know, the fluidity of the lipids and the kinetic energy is low. So um, lipid protein interaction would be kind of um, kind of absent, right? So it forces the peptide to aggregate in the water layer to form fibers. In the, in the fluid membrane, uh, what is driving the lipid extraction? What is the driving force for that? It's really the interruption of the protein with the hydrophobic core. So when the protein switches to this beta sheet competent state, it has a hydrophobic surface, which is then stabilized by the hydrophobic portion of the lipid. And this effectively lowers the nucleation barrier because this beta sheet prone state on its own would be unstable. But when it's in contact with another hydrophobic partner, um, tail of the lipid, this um, stabilizes it and effectively lowers the nucleation barrier. So really the key step there is this extraction of the lipid um, by this beta sheet prone state and then stabilizing each other and therefore fibrils growing which have lipids within them. So it's, that, that's a very good point. So if you think about the second structure, you were talking about the second structure being uh, hydrophobic and then extracting the lipids. What about the oligomers having hydrophobic um, exterior? And then does that play a role at all? Yes. So, I mean, in our um, model, we have only two states, but as we know, um, on the membrane, there can be other conformational transitions. And indeed, there, um, the and people, there is, um, a whole plethora of work showing that the oligomers or the states on the membrane have hydrophobic portions and that indeed would interact with the lipids a tail and could catalyze this further conformation or changes to a beta sheet prone state and kind of amyloid nucleus. Thank you very much. There are several questions. You can take a look at the Q&A folder. I'll read it for you. The first Thanks. one is from Ashutosh Tiwari. Very interesting talk. Have you tested the aggregates formed in presence of lipids having different flexibility for their toxicity? If yes, what does it show in terms of relative toxicity? Right, so it's a good point. Um, I'm not aware of um, 
of such measurements. I'm not saying that they don't exist because the liturgy is huge, as you know. Um, we know that um, when the lipids are fluorescent labeled, they do end up in uh, fibrils, so we do see them growing um, together with lipids. Uh, but how that relates to toxicity, honestly, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure if there are any quantitative measurements that would be very interesting to do. Thanks. It's connected to that. So do you think the lipid-bound fibrils are more stable than lipid-free fibrils? That's a good point. Um, they definitely yeah, catalyze, nucleate faster, but whether the structure and so on is more stable. I mean, I can imagine they're also more disordered because they have these lipids included within them. Yep. Um, so uh, I don't know. I wouldn't bet on that. Next question is from Philip Neudecker. Uh, just to clarify, your oligomers are always on pathway, or is there a, such a thing as off pathway oligomers in your model? Um, I mean, it's a good point which I um, did not have time to address. So we always see we see that oligomers give rise to uh, nuclei, okay. but not every oligomer does, and we analyze that extensively in a number of papers. Um, there is kind of a preferred oligomer size that's going to give rise to a nucleus. Uh, if oligomers are too small, they there will not be enough uh, proteins to kind of stabilize each other, and they will more often fall apart than nucleate. In that sense, they would be off pathway. So small oligomers would be off on pathway. The large oligomers often also are so stable that they would also be kind of on pathway. So there is a prefer, preferred re range of oligomers that are most likely to give rise to nucleation. Um, and then it comes to um, it's a kind of spectrum and then comes a bit also to a definition of what you consider on and off pathway. So what happens if you change the lipid composition to, or can you tweak around the lipid composition to um, kind of push the oligomers to off pathway, mm. make them uh, less feasible for aggregation? Right, uh, yes, I think you can, honestly, if um, the lipid composition is such that protein on its own would like to immerse Yep. Um, then what you would get is a membrane that has individual proteins immersed inside, but they would not prefer to meet each other. So if, in another way, if lipids like to wet a single protein that well, they will almost protect it from nucleation. So I think there are such scenarios where this can happen. Next question is from Ashutosh. Um, does the change in ratio of lipid to protein affect aggregation kinetics? It does. Yes. And it's faster, the highest ratio of lipid to protein. So, um, and it's also been measured in experiments it's just because they conoclate. So um, yeah, the more lipids you have, the more um, stable nucleus you have, and then they'll uh, aggregate more easily. Okay, next question is from Sunil Kumar. Um, nice talk. I wonder if your model fit to determine the secondary nucleation at both at the side and top of the fibers. Yeah. So we, we, our model cannot unfortunately capture that because we cap our fibrils. Yeah. Otherwise they would, by far the fastest process is growth. And if we were, wanted, when we wanted to study the secondary nucleation, if we didn't cap our fibrils, so we not, would not allow them to um, interact with proteins, our fibrils will just keep on growing and um, it is difficult to capture secondary nucleation. So um, the model we have at hand, unfortunately cannot answer that, but it's I think a great question and one that's still um, yeah, unanswered in the field. Okay, the last question uh, from Vijay Rangachari. Beautiful work. Have you looked into the components on the lipid surface, such as sugar distributions or cholesterol, et cetera, and complexation with the EBITA? Yeah. I'm wondering how secondary nucleation will differ for such EBITA lipid complexes. Yeah, so the only thing we looked at is um, different lipid lengths, which changes the fluidity without changing chemistry. And now cholesterol is super interesting because it has this different geometry. <laughs> so it's in, it has a kink, that's why it um, changes the fluidity just via geometry, but it doesn't correlate with the extraction of um, the lipids out. So then there the um, kind of situation is a bit more complex. And to be honest, our model of, or the model by Deserno for this uh, three-beaded lipid is not appropriate to capture this geometric effect of cholesterol. So um, we thought about it for a long time, but somehow we still didn't get to that point that we can model um, such kind of fine effects. Um, so yeah, I think um, that's, at least from a physical point of view, remains a bit unanswered. 
Thank you very much, Angela, for the nice presentation. If we can hang around towards the end, we can take more questions. So next speaker, uh, can you share your screen, Neville? And uh, get started on the PPT. Okay, the second speaker for today is Dr. Neville Vasallo, is an associate professor in the Department of Physiology and Biochemistry, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery from the University of Malta. After obtaining his uh, MD degree at the University of Malta Medical School, he was trained in molecular biology and biochemistry at the Department of Physiology and Biochemistry from Malta. His PhD studies and later uh, postdoctoral training were in the area of neurodegenerative diseases and protein misfolding at the Center of Neuropathology of the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, LMU, Germany. Since 2008, Professor Vasallo leads a research group dedicated to investigating the role of protein aggregation in amyloid diseases with a special focus on the interaction of aggregate structures with mitochondria. Uh, Dr. Vasallo is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So um, Neville, uh, thanks for joining us today. Please get started when you're ready. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you, obviously, for um, inviting me to uh, give this talk, Rams. Um, we move a bit south from Austria, actually, so a bit to, to Malta, um, and from the mountains to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, uh, however, the topic that we'll, I'm going to talk about will actually be, will overlaps a lot with, with um, from me, from what we just heard from, from uh, Andela. We're going to talk about oligomers, we're going to talk about membranes, uh, and their interaction, but uh, in this, in our particular case, what we studied was um, we focused our attention on the uh, interaction with mitochondrial membranes. And there, um, as I'll be showing you, there, um, we have made some uh, interesting observations in this regard, which I'd like to share with you. So to start off, um, okay, so basically we, uh, there's no need to introduce um, uh, put a long introduction on this on this uh, curve, which most of you um, would be familiar with. We just heard from Andela as well on this um, the protein aggregation sequence, starting from a native uh, monomer, which misfolds, um, forms the oligomers, and then with, with further stacking and further conversion into beta. Uh, sheet structures, um, uh, they ultimately form the uh, mature fibrils. This phase, the leg phase, is um, uh, an extremely complex phase in the sense that you have um, formation of nuclei, dissociation of nuclei back until you finally have um, a, uh, a nucleus formation which is sufficiently stable in order to um, initiate assembly into uh, larger, larger aggregates. Our attention, as we've heard um, in the previous talk as well, is focused on the oligomers. It is thought, and there is a lot of evidence now, that um, it is these species which are um, the most toxic. Um, fibrils, as we can hear, as we have heard as well, can in fact also um, uh, give rise to oligomers. And one of the reasons why oligomers are uh, toxic is as we can see in this a nice uh, schematic diagram from one of Fabrizio Keaty's reviews um, showing the conversion of from early soluble oligomers to uh, more structured protofibrils. Um, along this along this pathway, um, there is an obviously an increase in size, in stability of the structure, in compactness and in burial of hydrophobic groups. So as there is a progression of um, uh, oligomer size, um, uh, there is increasing burial of the hydrophobic um, exposure, hydrophobic exposure, which is actually highest in the earlier oligomers. And actually, uh, this, is, this, is, this is basically what is mainly taught to uh, give rise to be associated mostly with the with the toxicity. So oligomer size, small size, and high surface hydrophobicity are thought to be the key major determinants 
of toxicity, not least because um, this um, the, the hydrophobic exposure makes them makes these molecules, these aggregates, uh, highly promic promiscuous for interaction with other proteins um, and even, especially as uh, as we said, be seeing with with membranes. Okay. Um, so what types of interactions do we can do oligomers have with membranes basically there are three main um uh, three main mechanisms which which are which uh, are involved uh, one is called the carpet model in which the oligomers would form would form carpets would uh, cover the upper leaf they would mainly bind to the upper leaf outer leaflet of the of the membrane, um, causing a thinning of the membrane and more um, uh, allow non-specific um, increase in, in, in permeability uh, of the membrane. So that is, that is uh, referred to as carpeting. Um, the detergent model would be like we heard um, an extraction, basically of uh, lipids as as by the by the aggregates resulting in a disintegration of, of the membrane. The barrel state model uh, would refer to the to, to actual pore formation. So the formation of transmembrane ion conducting pores in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the membrane. Okay. Um, so these would be the three major mechanisms of how uh, oligomers would be expected to interact with lipid membranes. Um, one landmark, a landmark paper uh, regarding interaction of amyloid with membranes was published by Ratnesh Lal's group now in uh, uh, 2005, in which they, ob they observed um, the ion channel conduction by different peptides, by different amyloid peptides. So we have the um, amyloid beta peptide, IAPP peptide, um, peptides related to British and Danish familial dementias, alpha synuclein and serum amyloid A. So um, when these using electrophysiology, which we also um, single channel electrophysiology, uh, you can see these current jumps reflecting um, uh, fluctuations, ion, ion fluctuations through to the membrane. Um, these electrophysiological findings were associated with formation of uh, pores on AFM, okay, as visualized by AFM. Um, you can see a, a number of subunits around the central pore by each of these peptides. So this really gave a, a, a strong boost to the uh, amyloid pore hypothesis. So the fact that um, a common mechanism uh, of action of, uh, of um, the amyloid, amyloid, uh, a toxic uh, mechanism of the amyloid proteins is the uh, poration, the formation of pores in lipid, lipid membranes. Uh, tau at that time wasn't included, but in fact, later, um, in, in, in later on, uh, tau was also shown to form pore-like structures and displaced single channel conductances. Um, obviously, all these, these, um, uh, these experiments were done in in vitro settings. And uh, however, uh, in, in 2014, there was an interesting paper from uh, Kayet's group actually uh, showed the formation of Possibly, uh, let's say, but um, they do look like amyloid pores isolated from brain tissue, from dementia, from patients with dementia, lower bodies, and progress is supranuclear palsy, visualized by FM. So as you can see, again, that the typical structure of a uh, number of subunits around a central pore. So these were um, images from actual brain tissue. So it does appear at least um, for tau that uh, such pore formation also occurs in in vivo. Okay, so our interest was to look uh, specifically at uh, one particular uh, membrane, organelle membrane, which is that uh, the membrane of mitochondria. So we wanted to pose the question whether uh, amyloid pore ma formation formation does occur 
in mitochondrial membranes. Obviously, neuron synapses are packed with mitochondria, so um, you would expect uh, interaction of amylo intracellular amyloid aggregates, intracellular aggregates with mitochondrial membranes, perhaps even more so than with the plasma membrane. Um, and uh, tau is formed intracellular, tau aggregates form intracellularly, alpha synuclein form in intracellular, even a beta um, aggregates form intracellularly. So there is um, definitely a, a, a case to put forward that uh, mitochondrial membranes are could be uh, important targets of uh, amyloid aggregates inside inside cells. Um, a few words, okay. Uh, in fact, in fact, um, uh, this again the interaction with mitochondria of for tau and alpha synuclein has also been shown. Um, uh, so it does occur in vivo again. So injection of, for instance, here injection of mice. APPPS1 mice with uh, tau um, uh, resulted in tau immunoparticles associating with mitochondria. Okay, um, uh, in another uh, another recent recent paper um, uh, examining Lewy bodies from postmortem brain tissue. Uh, the Lewy positive, uh, the alpha synuclein positive aggregates had a had a ring of mitochondria and uh, also other mitochondria associated, directly associated with the synuclein aggregates. So this, inter this interaction does indeed occur, occur uh, in vivo as well. Okay, so uh, a bit of an introduction on mitochondrial membranes. Mitochondria have two membranes, as we all know, so the an outer, uh, and an inner membrane. Um, uh, the constituents, phospholipid constituents, include phosphatidylcholine PC, PE, PS, PI. Um, one particular, the signature phospholipid of mitochondria is cardiolipin. So cardiolipin is uh, only found in um, energy generating membranes, such as those of of mitochondria, it is, and it also has a particular special structure. It is basically a dimeric phospholipid with, with um, four acyl chains and two phosphate phosphate groups, and it is distributed unequally in the mitochondrial membrane. Um, so we have around around five percent in the OMM, um, much higher. Uh, con cardiolipin contact in the inner mitochondrial membrane around 15% and uh, and even higher than that even even um, a concentration of cardiolipin even higher than that can be achieved at so called contact sites so sites of contact between the OMM and the and the IMM um uh, cardiolipin has due to its its um, structure it has a particular it has this Conical shaped, conical shaped uh, structure due to the four bulky, the four bulky acyl chains, which gives rise to a particular and important property of cardiolipin, the fact that it forms negative curvatures. Okay, it can form negative curvatures. In fact, it is found in high concentrations at negative curvatures at the in the crystal of the of the mitochondria. Um, functionally, it is important also for has important roles in bioenergetics. Um, it helps keep the the um, form the what are called respirosomes or super complexes of respiratory chains to keep them to keep one one uh, subunit next to each other and therefore facilitate the electron transport transport from one to the other. So it, it improves the efficiency of the electron uh, transport chain. It's also involved in in apoptosis in the in, in, in the binding of, of cytochrome C. So it has uh, very important functions related to um, the energetics of mitochondria. Okay, so when we wanted to study therefore the uh, the amyloid uh, our amyloid <coughs> proteins with uh, mitochondrial membranes, we had to basically um, we devise different types of Membranes. Um, we included 
we try to as much as possible reflect the physiological content of the of the actual mitochondrial membrane. So we made OAMP type outer membrane type with membranes with 5% cardiolipin, inner membrane type with around 15% uh, cardiolipin. And then we, to, to be able to see the effect of cardiolipin, um, we made an equivalent membrane without uh, cardiolipin. So we call that the L-type. We also had a, a another uh, membrane type, which contains a, a fixed um, combination of the OPE PS PC and 532 combination, which also lacks cardiolipin. Um, the important point here is that the negative charge on this membrane is similar to that with the cardiolipin membrane. So here we have would have two membranes with a similar negative charge, the main difference being one having cardiolipin and the other uh, not having cardiolipin. Okay, so the the to, to check for amyloid pore formation, basically we uh, used the uh, procedure of single channel bilayer electrophysiology as we saw in the, pre, in the, in the uh, as we saw previously. Um, so we made our 15% cardiolipin IM type membranes. Uh, the membrane is established across the, this, the <clears throat> this septum here and between two chambers in which obviously you would have your, your buffer solution. Okay, so we would form a circular membrane um, uh, across, the, across the aperture and we would place the, um, our aggregates in, in, the, in, in one chamber and wait basically for something to happen. And thankfully something did happen um, and which was something of the sort. So, for example, this is showing a, a, a typical trace with um, 0.4 micromolar tau oligomers added to the to the to that solution. Um, so you can see fluctuations there representing the ion conductance through the membrane. Then we proceeded to characterize these 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 pores, and for instance, you carried out um, IV curves to see whether there is any voltage dependence for, for the of opening of these um, uh, channels, which there is not, it's perfectly linear. Um, uh, we also uh, used asymmetrical buffer conditions to look at, uh, to see whether there is any selectivity for ions by the, by the, um, by the pores. And uh, in this case, in the case of the tau oligomers, we didn't find any, any um, preference to uh, any positively or negatively charged ions. But what was really particularly interesting when we analyzed the traces, okay, when we analyzed the traces to see, to look at the, and we make these histograms um, of conductance, found that the conductances weren't. Uh, spread randomly over there, but were actually grouped around um, different peaks uh, and the, 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 the of, around different peaks of conductances and the peaks where the, the conductance levels seem to be multiples of each other as well. So we have around 720 arrows. So this would be around twice, twice that conductance. This would be around three times uh, um, the the, the that's called, or twice this conduct and so um, there was this uh, quantization uh, quantization of um, of conductance levels which we in fact refer to open one open two and open three and um, we also compared the conductance levels to the step size so the step size is giving you how much uh, the current jumps from one state to the other okay. Um, and for instance, the step size in, 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 in the case of the tau uh, pores was basically mainly around 200 to 300, 400. So mainly it corresponded, it corresponded to this conducting, conductance uh, level. From this information, we built a model, a tentative scheme of what would be happening with these with these um, different conductances. Obviously, it was clear that we had um, 
a heterogeneous conductance but it wasn't only stable at just at one um, at one level there was fluctuation from one level to the to the other um, but in the case of tau we all, we always absorb uh, observed a a jump of from one conductance to the other so we didn't see for instance open tree closing uh, becoming um, closing completely uh, from open one to two, two to three, three to two, two to one, etc. All right. So there was clearly this dynamic, uh, this dynamic change um, in in the in the pore in the pore size, which we calculated through the through the um, knowing the, the the conductance to be from one to around two nanomolar. So that would be nanometer. So that would be the the size of the inner. Uh, estimated size of the of the inner pore. Um, with regards to alpha sanuclein, we um, observed something. We also observed um, uh, channels uh, again this, uh, along uh, defined levels, defined conductance levels. So this is one micromolar alpha sanuclein oligomers monomers. When we added monomers, by the way, same with the tau, we observed no change. Uh, whatsoever <coughs> with the in the conductances and um, sometimes we observed with the oligomers also a, a, a bilayer collapse probably implying a um, breakdown breakdown of the of the bilayer um the i the alpha sanuclein channels were also uh, not voltage dependent however we did find we did observe um and the with the with the, in the asymmetrical buffers a preference for for um, negatively charged negatively charged ions. Okay, so they had a a preference for uh, anionic ions. Um, again, we have this nice distribution of conductance levels. Again, with a quantization, hundred to hundred, peaking at here yeah, four hundred, because immense. Step sizes, we also observe step sizes of 400, around 400. So um, the, the model here, okay, probably would include the, the uh, opening and closing of the larger of the larger pores as well. Okay, um, but essentially we still have, we, we again observe um, a dynamically changing pore, which um, could uh, some close from open two, for instance, go to open one, to open two, open three, and then close, etc. Okay, um, coming back to the cardiolipin. Um, obviously, we're interested to to see what effect would changing the content of cardiolipin have on the spore formation. And in fact, um, so we calculated the the the, the pore insertion frequency. So um, so practically for tau and, and alpha sanuclein, at least around half of the times we tried the experiment, we observed poor, poor insertion with the IM type membrane. Once we removed the cardiolipin, the poor insertion frequency dropped dramatically, um, therefore implying that the cardiolipin was somehow in, uh, increasing the, the frequency of poor insertion, even though, for instance, the C-type would have the same uh, negative charge as the IM type, okay? So it's not a simply of, uh, it's a question of charge. Um, we confirmed this by uh, looking at leakage from liposomes. So we made liposomes with the same types of membranes, going from zero, five to 15% cardiolipin, and uh, we observed that increasing the cardiolipin content increased the amount of leakage from the liposomes. So this was supporting the idea of um, the form of membrane damage, um, which, which was aggravated by, by high cardiolipin content. Um, we, we, then we also looked at the um, model involving isolated mitochondria. So we wanted to um, actually look at uh, actual uh, actual mitochondrial mitochondrial membranes so we isolated mitochondria from sushi cells and we exposed them to the oligomers and we looked at swelling of mitochondrial swelling and which would obviously reflect damage to the damage to the um, 
outer and or inner membranes and uh, cytochrome C release, which can occur either from swelling of the mitochondria, mitochondrion and therefore um, uh, uh, bursting of the, of the outer membrane as a result with release of cytochrome C or due to formation of membrane pores and passage of cytochrome C through, through those pores. Uh, in fact, we did observe um, swelling with cow oligomers. We tried a range of um, inhibitors of the mitochondrial permeability transition pore, which did not, however, make any effect uh, on, the, on the swelling. Um, what was particularly interesting, we also found, by the way, we also found cytochrome C release by tau. So we had cytochrome C release and mitochondrial swelling by these oligomers, um, by the same oligomers that we had tested on the, in the electrophysiology assay. What was particularly interesting is that when we, we turned our attention to cardiolipin and used a cardiolipin specific binding dye, um, a neo uh, non-acridine orange, which, so when we pre-incubated the mitochondria with this dye, um, the reasoning was that the dye would bind to the to the to the cardiolipin and prevent uh, binding of the oligomers. And that was when we in fact observed uh, protection from swelling and from cytochrome C release. Okay. Um, so something seemed to be going on there. Uh, so we looked at this further. We again we we um, mixed it oligomers with our mitochondria, precipitated the mitochondria, and looked whether we had tau uh, precipitating with the mitochondria, which we did. But in the presence of a neo, there was no no tau with the with the mitochondria, um, therefore indicating that uh, the NA was indeed preventing this interaction from occurring. We also looked at blue used blue native gel retardation assays to compare the IM type with the C type membrane. And basically, in the case of the cardiolipin containing membrane, increasing the lipids, the increasing the amount of lipids of lipid decreased the tau in the in the gel. Okay, the, um, so it it, it 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 prevented the gel from from uh, prevented the tau from. Uh, moving, moving across the gel. So, therefore, therefore confirming um, binding of tau to the IM type, but this didn't happen with the C type. Okay, so clearly, again, we have a preference for the cardiolipin containing membrane of the, of the tau. Um, a similar thing, we observed a similar thing with the alpha synuclein oligomers, so NAO, preventing the swelling, preventing the cytochrome C release. We also used um, uh, together with our German colleagues, we looked at uh, used uh, FIDA and uh, fluorescence coloration spectroscopy with labeled lipids and labeled protein, and we found a, a, a higher percentage of alpha synuclein bound to vesicles with IM type compared to L type, which lacked the cardiolipin. So here we had a story basically building. Uh, a story building which which seemed to indicate a preference for alpha synuclein tau, tau oligomers to bind to and to cause damage to uh, mitochondrial membranes. We expanded this idea then by looking at uh, HIPF. HIPF is basically a an E. coli um, protein, the actually the N terminal domain of an E. coli protein, which is not related to any human amyloid disease. However, uh, it can form oligomers, protofibrils, and amyloid-like fibrils in vitro, and it recapitulates the structural and mor morphological features of uh, the proteins and peptides which cause disease. Um, and a particular advantage of uh, HIPF is the fact that you can aggregate it into toxic and non-toxic type uh, oligomers, and therefore this would this would be very nice to for us to. Um, to look at our our um, to test our hypothesis with regards to the cardiolipin lipin binding. Um, so in fact, uh, when we tested the HIPF type A type B oligomers, we found a huge difference in toxicity. Um, not only to to uh, to the IM type, but actually also to the C type. But most toxic was always to the IM type IM type membranes. 
Um, uh, and we also found cytochrome C release and impairment of mitochondrial membrane potential by the type A and not the type B oligomers. Uh, then when we tested again the, the type A oligomers on for channel-like activity, we, again we found um, channel-like activity in our cardiolipin uh, membranes with the type A uh, oligomers. So we at this stage we um, test we showed targeting of amyloid oligomers to mitochondrial membranes with alpha synuclein, tau, HIPF. More recently, we also have looked at the uh, amylin, the islet amyloid polypeptide. Uh, so this is basically um, unpublished data so far. Um, what is particularly interesting with IAPP is that, that in, for IAPP, the fibrils were also toxic, like the oligomers. However, um, when we added NAO to try to inhibit the toxicity, we did inhibit the toxicity of the, of the oligomers, but much less so of the fibrils. So um, it appears that this, this um, cardiolipin, this mechanism involving cardiolipin is in fact um, specific for the oligomer type of toxicity, but not the fibrous type of toxicity, um, reflecting different mechanisms. Probably the oligomer would be more prone to amyloid pore formation. The fibrous would be would be more related to to uh, to extraction. Um, we also, in fact, uh, inhibited um, using NAO uh, swelling by the by IAPP. Okay, so. What could be the role of what could cardiolipin be doing to make to make the membranes more susceptible uh, for uh, toxicity? Um, basically, two things. One, it could it could be affecting the physical the basic physical chemical properties of the membrane. It is known that increasing cardiolipin content of the membrane makes it more makes it more uh, disorders more prone to have membrane packing defects uh, in fact we did observe um, uh, increased fluidity uh, using both lardan and the ph which are two uh, probes for membrane fl fluidity lardan detects um, more surface uh, fluidity um, the ph uh, uh, it, it inserts into the a side a side layer in it and therefore is, is an indicator of membrane fluidity inside the bilayer. And, but in both cases, we see, uh, we saw um, a greater degree of fluidity with, with increasing cardiolipin. Um, so that could be one factor, one factor um, explaining to explaining the uh, increased susceptibility of these type of membranes to amyloid. A second factor could be actual direct, direct binding by, so specific cardiolipin binding by the oligomers to the cardiolipin. In fact, this is um, from a recent paper um, showing how PMCA, um, uh, PMCA alpha synuclein generated alpha synuclein oligomers preferentially bound to cardiolipin from all the other Phospholipids. So there is actual a preference for card. So this is a protein lipid over overlay assay in which the, the lipids are spotted on the on, on the membrane. The protein, in this case, the oligomers are, are added in the solution, and then you do a, a normal Western blot to detect the the the, the binding. Um, and as you can see, there was this specific a st very strong. The strongest binding was to the was to the cardiolipin for the alpha synuclein oligomers. I mean, expanding this more. Um, there is actually um, uh, in so beyond the amyloid amyloid field, um, uh, cardiolipin actually does provide. It, it's known to provide specificity for targeting of Bax and related peptides to mitochondria. Um, so it's it has been um, you know uh, found that the um, cardiolipin containing membranes promote the insertion. Of Bax, of Bax oligomers, and membrane pore forming activity. So basically, it's more almost exactly what we're what we're seeing with the alpha synuclein, and with our amyloid um, peptide aggregates. Um, uh, the same thing that we were seeing there. Um, 
Again, so you would have contact sites with high concentrations of cardiolipin attracting the truncated BID, inserting, causing the insertion of the BEX, oligomer formation, uh, pore formation, and release of cytochrome C. So all these processes we, in fact, observed similarly in our, in our models. Um, perhaps even, uh, even more interesting, we, we, um, we often hear of compar uh, comparison of mechanisms of the amyloid peptides with might uh, antimicrobial -micro microbial pore forming toxins. In fact, there are examples of uh, microbial pore forming toxins which target mitochondria. Um, so for example, Nasero gonorrhea pore biporin um, incorporates into the IMM forming high conductance pores around 420, which we did observe um, our, uh, with, the, with the amyloid pores as well. And uh, Helicobacter pylori, another example, the stomach bug, uh, Helicobacter pylori, a toxin forming oligomeric pores with an ion conducting central cavity in ion like bilayers with anion selectivity. So basically, the toxin is taken up, it's, it's into the cell, it, it, it translocates via TOM into the mitochondria, inner membrane forms um, uh, pores in the inner membrane and allows uh, chloride chloride um, influx into the into the mitochondrial matrix. Uh, so this is again, so this appears to be a phenomenon which is actually observed by um, microbial, microbial peptides. So to conclude, um, we have shown that we have observed that tau alpha sonuclein and IAPP amylin oligomers caused mitochondrial dysfunction, swelling, cytochrome release, um, drop in mitochondrial membrane potential, and formed discrete ion conducting pores in mitomimetic planar bilayers. This is supported by the mitochondrial work in which the uh, oligomers preferentially targeted membranes rich in cardiolipin with NAO, a cardiolipin specific dye, protecting the mitochondria against damage by the uh, oligomers. The HIPFN data um, support this idea of inherent toxicity, therefore, of oligomeric, oligomeric aggregates to mitochondrial membranes rich in cardiolipin. Um, hence, the, the, our idea that the uh, membrane-active oligomeric aggregates of amyloid-forming proteins may be considered as perhaps a new class, a new type of mitochondrial porins. Um, and this is more or less a summary of um, what we have been uh, talking about, so insertion of pores in, in, in cardiolipin rich spill contact sites, um, uh, domains, um, formation of the pore, movement of water, solutes, swelling, cytochrome C release, fallen member potential, and bioenergetic failure. Um, okay, so if I've come to the end of my talk, perhaps just a minute to um, uh, promote briefly our our um, uh, the the research topic, um, which I am I am uh, oh, which I am with together with Alfonso and Sandrine Ongeri. We are we have a research topic on oligomers in amyloid associated diseases. So the call for papers is open. So I I would uh, invite. Um, um, I know many of you would be interested are working on oligomers. So. Um, you are invited to send us uh, your your work. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, um, acknowledge the the our um, my students and collabor main collaborators Fabrizio who gave us the HIPF, Armin Giese and Christian Griesinger in Germany. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Neville, for thank an excellent you. talk. Um, nice work. Thank you. Um, let me get started with the one of the mm -hmm. questions that I have is uh, on your synuclein monomer versus oligomer. Mm -hmm. Oligomer showing the um, voltage activity across the membrane um, in the patch mm -hmm. experiment. So these oligomers, I would assume, that preformed in solution, right? Yes. In so this if in that is the case, the oligomer will have hydrophilic exterior. How do they interact with the membrane and form pores? All those details. How do you think? What's going on okay. there? Well, okay. Um, the obviously what what we, what we lack here is is structural information. I mean, we have uh, obviously the electrophysiological data, but actual 
uh, uh, structural information. We, we, we don't, so we never actually saw, have never actually seen these these oligomers in the in, in the member. But the way they behave, um, and and the, and the, the discrete uh, the, 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 the the discrete conductance is uh, strongly suggest that that they are forming performing pores in the membrane. Um, it basically it's um, so so we do like we do like we do like the data. Um, uh, our next step, in fact, is to try to to try to um, get an instrument in which we can have both both the 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 structural information as well as the electrophysiological formation. But for this, you would need a horizontal rather obviously than a vertical bilayer um, to be able to to visualize your oligomers um, uh, optically. But you're right; they were preformed. So uh, do they have to be oligomers? Can you not have a structured monomers form, yeah. assembling to form uh, pores, right? Yes. You don't yes. have to have oligomers, I, right? Yeah. However, however, to be, we try, we tried. Whenever we tried monomers, we 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 at least in the length of time of our experiment, because of, which which basically would last around two hours, um, uh, we never observed poor formation from addition of oligomers, neither for alpha semiclane nor for nor for tau, um, nor for IAPP, in fact. Okay, let me take a question from the Q&A mm -hmm. folder from uh, Tom Rothstein. He's asking, did you say uh, fibrils are equally toxic in comparison with oligomers? I assume he's talking about IAPP. Yes, we did observe in the in that cytochrome C release. Yes, in that of cytochrome C release essay on mitochondria, we did observe a, a toxicity of fibrils, um, a similar toxicity to, to to the oligomers. Something which we hadn't observed to be fair with the mitomimetic liposomes. Uh, so with 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 the liposomes, um, with the mitomimetic liposomes, we didn't see toxicity with fibrils. However. With the, with, with the uh, mitochondrial membranes, we did. Um, however, as I, as as I said, the mechanism is most likely to be to be different between between the, the mechanism of toxicity between the fibrils and the oligomers um, uh, appears to be different because the response to the NAO, uh, the, the cardiolipin binding NAO dye, is actually is actually different. So I guess the the, the they they are both toxic, but the mechanism appears to be different. I have another question on the cardiolipin mm -hmm. selectivity. Um, do you think the selectivity is because the charge charge interaction? It does have a lot of charges on the head group. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know, but, exactly. I know. Uh, and charge is, in fact, one of the but, things. But, but, but I also have another, uh, another issue here that it, it, it seems to, cardiolipin seems to aggregate and form a high density uh, inducing curvature, right? It physically yeah. curves the membrane. So do you think yeah. the curvature is changing the affinity of oligomer binding or protein binding as well as that enabling could, or disabling uh, insertion? Can that you, could can very you, well be, yes. That could very well be the case, yes. So yes. did you did you try varying yes, the concentration of cardiolipin to push towards more curved membrane to see if that promotes or uh, depromote? Yeah. What we are, yeah, what we are trying at the moment is to use cardiolipin variants. Uh, so there is, for instance, monolysocardiolipin, which mm -hmm. has three A site, A site mm -hmm. rather than four. So it doesn't give you that much, that much curvature. Um, how 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 would a membrane with that respond to 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 um, to the oligomers? Would it still be would you would still be the still see the same toxicity? That is something which we are. Actually, actually looking at through through, through this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take questions from okay. Q and A from mm -hmm. uh, Velayu. Them it says, um, "Great talk. Does oligomers affect the mitochondria targeted proteins importing import into the mitochondria?" We haven't looked at that. Whether they target, we haven't looked at that. However, there is literature. Um, uh, showing showing um, take up even for instance of alpha cyclin by Tom. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, next okay. question is from Alfonso. Excellent okay. talk. Data from the Gandhi Lab, 2018, suggested mm -hmm. that 
synuclein oligomers directly interact with the ATP synthetase, and this in turn would trigger the formation of mitochondrial pores. Cardiolipin is also quite abundant in the proximity of this protein. What is your view about such very specific interactions by alpha synuclein oligomers with mitochondrial proteins? Okay, yes. Uh, um... Cardiolipin uh, is, is, as I said, it, it, it has very important roles in the, in the inner membrane. It helps this formation of the, of the, it interacts with different respiratory complexes, in fact, um, and helps in the formation of these large, large respirosomes. Um, so this uh, disruption of the, disruption, binding of the oligomers to the cardiolipin and sort of removing the cardiolipin from, from and preventing this um, interaction of uh, cardiolipin with uh, respiratory complex could also be another, actually, another mechanism of, of action. Um, uh, for instance, one thing that I mentioned is the tethering. There's tethering of cytochrome C to cardiolipin as well. Um, so presumably binding to that could also release release the the, the the cytochrome C from. So it does definitely it does it, it would an interaction with cardiolipin would would definitely um, uh, have a knock on knock on knock on effect on its interaction with other mitochondrial proteins and especially the respiratory um, uh, respiratory complexes. Yes. So uh, let me ask you a question. So it looks mm -hmm. like cardiolipin pretty much. Um... From based on what you're shown here, pretty much promotes the oligomer insertion for many different proteins. So, mm -hmm. do you have any examples where you have oligomer that doesn't get promoted by cardiolipin? Yes, the type B hip F, if I can, uh, okay. which was our, yeah. Uh, so, actually, that was a nice, a nice uh, control for us. So, we had an. an so, why is that? Why, why it doesn't get. Why promoted? is that? It, it appears to be related to toxicity somehow. Um, so, so um, uh, the uh, most likely, as far as far as I know, the, the main difference between so what is the difference between type A and type B? Mm -hmm. Hep um, We got basically these peptides, by the way, from from Fabrizio, um, who collaborated uh, with us on this on this on this work. Um, it, I, I believe it, it's it, it's mainly concerns the burial of the hydrophobic, the burial of what I had mentioned in, in the beginning, the burial of the hydrophobic exposed ex, uh, exposed domains. So so in the type B, um, there is uh, less hydrophobic, less hydrophobic exposure. So I think that is in a nutshell what the the, the which therefore increases its its it, it's it's binding to 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 the cardiolipin membranes. Yep. But I would expect all oligomers to have hydrophobic. Okay. Why 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 is it cardiolipin? The card what's, what's no, no, no. particular hydrophobic surface to be hidden inside the oligomer in solution phase? Mm -hmm. so it should be only the hydrophilic mm. exposure exposed, right? In, for any type of oligomers formed in in solution. So I'm not sure the hydrophobic surface alone is responsible no. for, for formation. Okay, okay, Grant. Uh -huh. um, probably there would be, it's not, uh, uh -huh. it wouldn't be the, 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 the only, I mean, electrostatics, do, they are not the only, but they do play a part as well. I mean, when we compared charge, um, there was, there was, there was uh, the, the, the charge, the, Decreasing the, the 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 charge of the membrane did decrease the binding. Okay, so so charge definitely has an effect as well. Um, so I I mean it's either a a I mean it probably it's a combination of the two. Um, the 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 a change in the physical chemical properties that the cardiolipin gives to the membrane and a a, a sort of um, a direct interaction of the oligomers with the cardiolipin. I mean, the fact that, that this, this phenomenon is also observed in, in, in nature, no? in, 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 for example, in the, the Bax um, um, uh, proteins, and, and, uh, and there are others, 
Um, for instance, I, if I could just show that I had, I had an extra slide here. Okay, this is this is gas dermin D, which is okay. It's not mitochondria as such, but um, this was a recent Nature paper in which the endthermal domains of these gas dermin proteins bound strongly to cardiolipin liposomes eh? and causing membrane disruption, liposome leakage, and cytotoxicity. So again, you have the eh, specific strong binding to cardiolipin or formation and leakage by binding through cardiolipin. So it does it does appear to, to be important in poor form in poration of, of membranes. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Neville, great talk and thank great you. Q &A. Also, Angela, thank you very much. Um, Danilo, you have any questions? Sorry, I didn't ask the panel members. Ah, it's fine. Thank you, Neville. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Hi. Thank you. Okay. I would like to thank both the speakers for the great presentations and thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Ciao.